Hi everyone. This is a tutorial that's just meant to make sure we're all on the same page regarding the scientific method and also to introduce a little bit the concept of the engineering design process as well as to discuss how to properly design an experiment. Now, um, the scientific method's a topic that seems to come up over and over and over again in science classes throughout the years, so I'm not necessarily going to go through each and every step in excruciating detail because, again, I think you've heard this a fair amount from other teachers in your previous science classes. But I did want to make a couple of points that I feel are important and I think we should review before moving on. Um, the first point I want to make about the scientific method is that it's often presented sort of linearly as if to say one step leads to the next which leads to the next with a definite beginning when we are trying to form a hypothesis to the very end when we're drawing conclusions. But I would like for you to consider the scientific method being more of a cycle, being something that sort of loops around itself. And the reason that is, is because again, usually the data that we collect in any step of the process influences the other steps of the process as well. So yes, though it is true that we do typically start in the process by developing theories and making observations so that we can then go and eventually, after asking questions, actually go and come up with a hypothesis and then obviously we're going to test the hypothesis with an experiment. Even though this is true, basically the other point that I think is important to make is once we actually do gather the data from the experiment, so once we're basically at this step, well, it all depends on what that data looks like as to what we do next. If the outcome that we expected is exactly what we get, well, then we might want to repeat the experiment, so we would go through another loop of the experiment once again just to confirm our findings. However, if it turns out that the data does not actually match what we expected, then it's entirely possible that we might not be able to proceed in the loop once again, and we'd have to actually go and sort of work towards asking ourselves why it is that the experiment did not turn out as we had expected. And so the steps in the process are not as linear as you might think regarding the scientific method. And in terms of when we would use the scientific method, obviously, you know, we use it to ask ourselves questions and sort of to gather knowledge or information. Okay, but it doesn't really necessarily apply to specific problems in the sense that we're not trying to carry out this experiment to fix something, or we're not trying necessarily to carry out this experiment to fulfill a specific need, usually in terms of uh, what we're doing the experiment for. It's usually for further study, for us to understand things better, but it's not necessarily done to directly influence the development of technology. That's really more the area of the engineering design process. So, for example, all right, here we have a copy of the engineering design process here. Um, once again, notice it is a cycle. Basically, it isn't necessarily a straight line. Basically, we can and often do repeat steps, proceed backwards or forwards as the needs of the uh, project dictate. But here, the important thing about the engineering design process is it's used to solve a specific problem. And a lot of times that solution to that problem requires developing technology. Now technology isn't always something that's electronic or a machine, a device. Sometimes technology can be you know, a pathway of chemical reactions to actually go and create a chemical compound that we need. So basically technology can be really a broad range of ideas or broad scope of different scientific and engineering principles that we might develop to address something specific that we're looking to uh, solve or some 
problem that we're trying to actually study in greater detail. Now notice that the engineering design process actually does have steps in common to the scientific method. It's not a completely brand new concept. Basically when we're asking questions to identify the need or identify constraints, constraints mean limits, and we're researching the problem, that's the same thing as asking questions. in the scientific method or making observations. And if we consider the imagining, developing possible solutions, selecting a promising solution, all of this is actually something that be, can be considered brainstorming. All right now this brainstorming in terms of the scientific method tends to lead to a hypothesis, but in the engineering design process, this brainstorming process leads to something that we call a prototype. And the prototype is essentially sort of the first version of the technology that we are looking to develop. And then once we actually have the prototype, which is again sort of like a hard copy, something tangible, an object that be, can be considered sort of the hypothesis, in terms of our engineering design process, then we have to test to make sure that that prototype works. And so here, this testing and evaluation, this is pretty much the same as our experiment when we're considering the scientific method. Now, once we gather our data from this experiment, then that data is going to help us decide what to do. Do we have to improve our prototype? So if we have to improve our prototype, then once again, we have to ask ourselves how. We have to get back to this step about asking questions and doing further research. Do we have to redesign the prototype? Once again, that leads to asking questions. But overall, once again, the data influences what decision we make. Now, in general, engineers will not usually be satisfied with their prototype. Usually they always make improvements and they redesign the technology so that this way they feel that they've met all of the constraints or the limits associated with the project. Now, regardless of whether you're carrying out an experiment to evaluate a prototype in the engineering design process, or if you're actually gathering data to test predictions in the scientific method, you're still running an experiment. And that means that you're going to have to design that experiment. Now, designing an experiment involves making sure that you think of all of the variables. And the variables are, are again, much like in math class, things that can change. In an experiment. And so there's more than one type of variable involved in an experiment, whether it a test in the engineering design process or if it's an experiment within the scientific method. Now the independent variable is the variable that is chosen by the scientist to be changed on purpose. So basically it's what the scientist controls directly. The dependent variable is the outcome of the experiment. So for example, suppose that I'm running a chemical reaction, all right, and I hypothesize that it's possible that if I run this reaction at a higher temperature, then maybe the reaction will occur faster. Well, then that would mean that the thing that I control that I'm changing on purpose would be the temperature. And the dependent variable would then be, again, what I'm expecting to change because I'm changing the temperature. So in this particular case, that would be the speed of reaction. Just to give you an example of that relationship between the independent variable and the dependent variable. Now constants are parts of the experiment that could change if I let them, but basically these are things that we don't want to change. So for example, in my example regarding you know a chemical reaction, I want to make sure that I use the same glassware Okay, that I use the same lab, 
same equipment from one trial of the experiment to the next so that the only thing that's changing is the temperature. Otherwise, if I let all of these other variables change, then that can cause me to have confusing data and it may not allow me to make the uh, proper conclusions from the experiment. Now, we also have controls. Now, what controls are, are points of comparison, all right, so that we can compare the experimental outcome to these controls to see whether or not the reaction worked and if it did, how well. And usually there are two types of controls. There's what we call the negative control. There's also the positive control. Now, the negative control means that I have not exposed the experiment or the particular subjects in the experiment to the experimental variable, whereas the positive control is where I've exposed the test subject or subjects to specific amounts of the experimental variable. Now, I know that can seem a little confusing, but really the best way to explain it is to give you guys a bit of an example of where that applies. So let's take a look at this example right here. All right, this is an experiment that was done to determine whether or not a secret ingredient in a breath mint will actually cure people of bad breath once they eat pizza with garlic and anchovies. So in this particular scenario, we have a scientist and she's taken 100 customers, okay? She's divided those 100 customers in half. Now, 50 of those customers, which she puts in what she calls group A, will receive the breath mint with the special ingredient in it, okay? So again, this is the breath mint with the special ingredient. Okay. However, the other 50, which she puts in group B, well, they're going to get a regular breath mint with no secret ingredient. Okay. Now, the customers eat, they have their breath mint that's been assigned to them, and then after a couple of hours, 30 customers in group A say they had better breath, 10 customers in group B said that they had better breath. Okay, so what's the independent variable? In other words, what is the scientist controlling? Well, the scientist is controlling the use of the secret ingredient in the breath mint. Okay, now what depends on whether or not the secret ingredient is used? Well, that would be the breath of the customers after eating the pizza. Okay, is it good or is it bad? Okay, now which people are in the control group? So which group, A or B, is used as the point of comparison to see whether or not the breath mint works? Well, if you read carefully through the description of the experiment, it's those folks that are in group B, right? They are an example of a negative control. They were not given the secret ingredient. And so in order to determine whether or not the secret ingredient worked or not, you give some of the customers a breath mint that does not have the secret ingredient. So that this way, if they report having more bad breath, uh, I'm sorry, if they actually report having a better improvement of their bad breath compared to group A, then you would conclude that basically there is no effect to the secret ingredient. The secret ingredient does not work. However, that is not the case here, because if you take a look at the description here, they say that 30 customers in group A reported an improvement in their breath, whereas 10 customers in group B reported an improvement in their breath. And so thinking of the last question, what should the conclusion be? We should conclude that the secret ingredient works. Okay, so get familiar with this idea of identifying variables. We're going to do an assignment in class tomorrow where you guys are going to practice doing this. I'll be going around, see how you guys do uh, please, by any means, if you have any questions about what's in this tutorial or how to do tomorrow's assignment, let me know.